Welcome back. Unfortunately, to our last lesson here on chapters 14 and 15, covering personality and abnormal psychology, uh, some of the disorders that you've probably been waiting all semester to hear about, uh, as well as some of the treatments for these disorders. Uh, but I think this is a nice combination in this case, uh, because personality is sort of our normal working uh, uh, way of thinking and acting, and abnormal psychology really focuses on the deviations from this. Uh, but to start, remember, personality is really just the, uh, the sum of all of our uh, feelings, emotions, ways of behaving um, that a lot of personality assessment nowadays uh, relies on by looking at words that are associated with emotions we feel. Uh, so the, the first technique uh, using these words called the lexical hypothesis actually factor analyzed uh, statistically all the words related to our emotions, feelings, and behaviors and looked for similarities and differences there. Um, but earlier than that, of course, there were the psychodynamic theories, you know, looking at these underlying unconscious uh, conflicts that we had uh, underlying what was going on really uh, on the outside. All right, so these uh, ideas like catharsis and uh, the unconscious, you know, catharsis being that release of energy because these tensions arise from these conflicts that we feel in our unconscious but don't necessarily uh, know about, they're not conscious to us, right? Um, psychoanalysis is one of the therapies we'll talk about later, the ways of assessing this unconscious, this repository of uh, things that we may not necessarily uh, uh, explicitly report um, but is motivating us in some way. So Freud thought not only that there was the unconscious and conscious, but also there was these different motivating forces, right? Our id, our uh, biological and sexual sort of demands, our superego, which is the, uh, you know, the morality rules, um, regulations, if you will. And the ego was the sort of manager of all this, uh, the, the executive function, some people refer to it as. Uh, social psychologists study this a lot as a... Um, a a monitor or a decision-making center of the brain. Uh, so the concept of ego depletion is the depletion or um, elimination of the reserve, uh, reservoir of uh, ego power, decision-making power. Adler was a follower of Freud, but he went a slightly different way. Uh, for, uh, Adler looked a little bit more at sort of the conflicts that we have uh, in terms of reaching some sort of ideal uh, self uh, but more so in terms of our struggle for superiority, uh, right? So he looked at things like inferiority as something we really struggled with, uh, and he, he sort of emphasized this sort of goal-directed uh, behavior, or this sort of striving for something, right? Uh, his you know, thoughts were actually um, sort of influential on later humanistic psychologists, uh, people like Rogers and Maslow. Uh, they were looking at sort of the the innate, the innate uh, motivation for people to be striving for something better, right? And like Adler looked at sort of a, a concern for others as well. Um, so, you know, they looked at behaviorism, one of the earlier theories looking at just our learned sort of responses uh, and psychoanalysis being the struggle with conflicts and being sort of negative and deterministic and reductionist that we're sort of just like animal sort of, uh, uh, animal, you know, sort of nature, uh, motivated to just reach some sort of a simple goal. But uh, Rogers and Maslow thought that we had this sort of not only an unconditional positive regard for others and we should approach situations with that, but also we had these sort of uh, higher level goals leading to self-actualization or becoming a whole person. Um, later, we sort of Abandon a little bit of that to look for specific traits. So now we think of personality less in terms of these motives and motivations like Maslow's hierarchy of needs and more so in terms of traits and states that make up the way we feel and behave, right? So traits being those enduring things and states being the more temporary things that sort of describe how we act, um, but not necessarily the chemicals that go behind it, right? Uh, trait approach basically just says that we're looking at those sort of traits that are consistently different between people like the big five. The big five personality traits are things like emotional stability or neuroticism, extroversion, uh, agreeableness, conscientiousness, and openness, or sometimes called openness to experience, right? Um, all of those are sort of independent or orthogonal, as we say uh, in psychometrics. 
and they've been measured uh, multiple times by different types of scales. We'll mention a couple of those. Um, not just scales, we can also use interviews and observations. Um, something like extroversion can be observed by watching someone's behavior, um, maybe by throwing them into a room full of people and seeing how far away they stand from the other people in the room. Uh, that, can, that can pretty accurately uh, predict someone's level of extroversion or gregariousness. You know, obviously interviews are also used pretty widely. Um, you ask people questions, they respond, you code that somehow. We'll look at other sort of interview methods like the thematic apperception test, uh, which is one of my favorites. Uh, the Barnum effect, which I think relates a little bit more to horoscopes, but also personality, uh, is sort of our tendency uh, to accept these sort of ratings of us, uh, no matter what sort of uh, method we're about to discuss is used. One of the more clinical ones is the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, um, which is a, a bunch of different items, you know, combined that all represent different types of uh, personality, right? Uh, there's some in there to even see if you're sort of lying, um, you know, things like that. Uh, but really looking at the sort of common things like schizophrenia uh, or other disorders that you may want to uh, identify in a clinical patient. Um, there's also projective personality tests, which I mentioned are some of my favorites. Uh, these sort of images, like you see on the right there, uh, where really they're looking to see what you project or um, see in the picture that maybe is from your own uh, unconscious attitude or value, if you will. Um, so that one, you know, there's something going on there. Uh, Whereas this one, if you look at it for a second, you may have a strong reaction that you feel something is going on there. Um, you may think that uh, he just uh, murdered or committed homicide. Uh, and you may think that he's getting up to go to work. Uh, but it may be more about you than the image <laughs> in terms of what you see. <clears throat> Some historical views of why personality goes abnormal, I'm not judging what you thought of that last image, but if you thought something uh, very bizarre, uh, maybe that uh, is explained by either a supernatural theory, right? Uh, some of the earliest theories of abnormal behavior were possession, basically. Um, there's also biological and psychological theories, or, um, you know, the... The, the reasons why our body would interact with our psychology. And the Greeks actually, in the early days, had some sort of biopsychological combination there um, where they saw the, uh, the different biles, like uh, if you were high in sanguinity, you had uh, uh, strength and virtue, uh, but it also meant that you just had a lot of blood. Uh, sanguine means that you had a lot of blood in your body. So it was sort of the biological... Um, you know, fluid mixed with the psychological outcome of that. Uh, so that's sort of the idea that there's a mixture there. And the biopsychological also includes their sociological uh, sort of cultural aspects of viewing people within their cultural context. Uh, many behaviors like a um, zombie uh, walk in downtown Long Beach maybe look very bizarre to another culture, um, but we may think it's very uh, normal now to have zombie walks in downtown Long Beach. Anyways, uh, nowadays, we basically look at them as inherited predispositions uh, towards certain things like depression, uh, have a genetic component. Um, you know, we also see uh, neural systems uh, through the imaging that we have, such as CAT scans and MRIs and functional MRIs. So seeing those uh, issues within the biological uh, functioning of the brain uh, or the neural system uh, uh, has advanced very far. We also uh, see the importance of stress and, uh, you know, learning histories, as we call them. Um, so the, the sort of social learning that we do uh, as we grow, and then the sort of stress that uh, compounds with that, as well as sort of the social support we get through uh, some of those situations, uh, as well as sort of the everyday hassles that we go through. Um, some of the most common ones that you see here um, you'll see anxiety disorders, uh, many people experience that, as well as mood disorders, uh, at least uh, at some point over their lifetime. Anxiety disorders specifically, uh, there's a couple of different types. Uh, that I was going to mention generalized anxiety disorder, which is one of those sort of uh, 
uh, ones that you might see a therapist for, maybe get prescribed medicine for. Uh, that's that free-floating anxiety that you have. Uh, whereas a panic uh, disorder or a panic anxiety disorder, it's where you're, it's associated with some sort of stimulus usually. Uh, so it's a spike in that, uh, that uh, reaction, uh, maybe to open spaces or to social situations, as those two might mention. Uh, we also have phobias, right? Those are uh, reactions to specific stimuluses um, that usually are linked to some sort of trauma, right? So if you uh, read comic books or watch uh, movies uh, involving superheroes, you know Batman uh, fell down the well and was scared by bats, at least in a lot of the origin stories, and that's sort of what uh, sort of made him embrace the bat, which is almost the opposite of a phobia. Um, but things like public speaking, uh, common things like that can be associated with phobias or having a little bit of a panic attack. Uh, one thing you can do is expose them. So, you know, even uh, for something as scary as uh, air travel for some people, uh, they get panic attacks getting on the plane. If you maybe take them to the airport, then take them through the gate, then get them on the plane, and then eventually they actually take a trip on the plane, uh, that sort of... Uh, what they saw uh, called desensitization or exposure therapy um, can can help out. Uh, spiders might be something that you may not like. Um, again, uh, the sort of gradual exposure to that may be through uh, PowerPoint slides <laughs> or people putting spiders around your room uh, could help you out with that. Other things like obsessive compulsive disorder um, are often displayed on TV and, uh, and media, usually incorrectly. <laughs> Um, but, you know, the, the classic movie is the uh, As Good As It Gets with Jack Nicholson where he will lock the door certain numbers of times and it causes distress if they can't uh, complete that uh, compulsive behavior um, due to the obsessive thoughts about it. So the obsessive is the thought, the compulsive is the behavior, uh, even though the behavior is what they usually focus on. Um, but anyway, sort of stopping that ritualized behavior or somehow rewarding the non-ritualized behavior uh, equivalent would be um, some of the most rewarding therapies for them. Post-traumatic stress disorder is one more that I think is important to note because it's the, uh, the sort of major psychological reaction to trauma uh, involving a, a variety of different trauma, um, usually reoccurring in dreams. Uh, so some of the best treatments for this are actually um, drugs that shut down the dream center. Uh, to help us sleep sleep and help sort of uh, calm the individual down. Uh, and then usually over time, uh, uh, integrating some sort of cognitive behavioral therapy uh, to reframe the events uh, that they're uh, reacting to, the, the trauma event that uh, stirred the, the post-traumatic stress. Depression is also something you see a lot uh, not just the major depression uh, that you think about uh, that is episodic, but also uh, literally seasonal uh, sorts of types of depression. Um, one of my friends had this, where uh, the, the seasonal sort of darkness and dreariness actually creates a state, um, you know, marked by decreased sleep, you know, some change in appetite, up or down, um, sexual disinterest, loss of energy, things like that. Um, and, you know, light boxes, you know, being exposed to light or changes in climate actually make the seasonal affective disorder go away. Uh, with other types of depression, there's all sorts of uh, um, remedies uh, from low-level depressions, uh, things like exercise help when it's major depression, uh, usually some sort of drug intervention is suggested. With schizophrenia, um, drugs usually help a lot. Um, there's some sort of antipsychotic drug variety uh, that's used to treat the sort of um, disassociation, the hallucinations, delusions that are characteristic of this disorder, um, usually occurring in men in their uh, mid to late 20s um, is when it occurs. And uh, there's some sort of deterioration of self-care and uh, usual activities uh, that give people a hint that someone might be having this uh, disorder onset, uh, which can be very scary, of course. Autism spectrum disorder is one that your book mentions and uh, is important with uh, the increased 
um, diagnosis for this. Uh, it's a lifelong condition. Uh, it was known for a while, or uh, higher end, uh, higher uh, functioning individuals were known for a while as Asperger's, uh, or they had Asperger's syndrome, but that's sort of been combined now um, to basically look at uh, the overall condition as being impaired social connectedness. Uh, very little was different between Asperger's, only one sort of difference being the uh, higher functioning. Um, but in general, it's uh, marked by impaired social relations, you know, the communication difficulties, uh, sometimes uh, very uh, um, severe uh, communication problems. And then some behaviors like uh, what they call hand flapping, uh, that's um, sort of comorbid, as they say, co-occurring with this. Um, therapies uh, don't really exist right now. Uh, I think the book mentioned something about fad therapies, um, but there's not a lot that goes on with autism. Um, it's more of a giving them opportunities idea. Um, uh, you know, give them opportunities, for example, an organization I work with that has uh, sports, so soccer, football, whatever, depending on the season, uh, for individuals with developmental disabilities, uh, mainly uh, individuals with autism. Um, who could go and play the sports and not necessarily uh, uh, feel left out from their brothers and sisters who are also playing sports. Anyways, one that the book doesn't mention but I think is important is the dysfunctions uh, of sexual desire. Um, so these are abnormal behaviors, let's say, if they're inhibiting sexual desire, the sexual aversion disorder, or any sort of arousal disorders, including things like vaginismus, dyspareunia, um, or you know, um, erectile dysfunction. Vaginismus being the, the muscles tightening and dyspareunia being the pain associated with um, intercourse and, of course, erectile dysfunction uh, in men or women, uh, which can be similar to inhibited sexual desire, sort of the non-existent sexual desire or the sort of fear of sexual contact. Um, in the case of sexual arousal, it's more the lack of a stimulus, maybe. If you go back to the Freudian stuff, uh, he looked at sort of fixations uh, and sort of uh, targets for sexual uh, uh, interest, which a lot of the uh, therapists who look at sexual disorders rely on. Now moving on to the therapies, psychotherapy is the major type of therapy we speak to that includes a lot of subtherapies like psychoanalysis, right? So psychoanalysis was basically the Freudian uh, idea that we had this unconscious sort of um, you know, mind that's filled with, uh, you know, these conflicts. Uh, so they use free association, you know, giving a, a image or a thought or a word uh, to the individual and seeing where their mind wanders, what they think of in association with that. Um, and dream analysis being sort of looking at the symbols, sort of the latent or manifest images. Um, so the latent meanings or the manifest images, I should say, uh, that may be, you know, representing what's going on in that unconscious, that may be bubbling to the surface. Other sort of psychotherapies involve behavior, cognitive and cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, which is probably more common than just plain old cognitive, and then the family and group therapies that exist. So behavior focusing mostly on sort of the learning that took place and maybe trying to restructure that learning, the reward, punishment, um, or reinforcement sort of ideas that are in place. Uh, as well as maybe associations um, and maybe changing uh, the behaviors, changing the rewards uh, uh, in some way. Cognitive is, you know, of course, uh, changing thoughts or restructuring thoughts, um, where cognitive behavior is looking a little bit more at the unwanted behaviors uh, associated with those thought patterns and changing the behaviors as well as the thoughts that go along with them. Some of the best ways to do therapy are through family and group therapies. Uh, the president of the university I work at uh, is a former family therapist and argues that organizations, uh, and I agree, uh, work almost as a family, right? So uh, issues at the organizational level for a university is similar to issues within a family where there likely are communication problems or other um, issues uh, in terms of the relationships. Uh, that need to be solved at that level that can lead to, uh, you know, change and healing and that sort of stuff. Uh, and, you know, group therapies can exist for a lot of reasons, um, whether it be eating disorders uh, or all sorts of things, uh, for people to sort of share their struggles as a way to uh, lead to healing. Finally, I can't go without mentioning uh, the sort of medical therapies that exist out there. 
uh, going from the early days of psychosurgery, which still exist in some form, uh, you know, uh, actually going in and medically changing some part of the brain <clears throat> to altering that with drug therapies, you know, or maybe a combination of, so, uh, you know, combination with other types of maybe cognitive therapies like AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, when they talk about alcohol abuse in your chapter, uh, maybe should be combined with the drug antabuse uh, that gives them the nausea when they have alcohol. Um, so the antabuse being the drug therapy uh, in addition to maybe some sort of psychological or psychotherapy. Uh, but there's also electroconvulsive therapy uh, where electric current is used and transcranial magnetic stimulation where magnetic pulses are used uh, to actually uh, address depression. Um, and even though those sound uh, somewhat barbaric, there's actually uh, been shown a lot of evidence that support their use in severe cases. Anyways, I hope this was enjoyable, and uh, don't forget to go check out the final exam on Beachboard.